The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Uh, it seems over the last like week and a half, I've been having the same conversation in like 17 different places. Uh, and it, it, it changes a little bit depending on the place, but uh, the conversation is basically this. Um, how you believe something or what you think about something impacts how you relate to others. Um, the Sunday morning Bible class knows this. We've been like stuck there for a couple weeks with regard to how we talk about baptism and Holy Communion and, and you know, what it means to uh, hold a belief and, and how that belief means you interact with other people. Um, and it's not just here that I've had this type of conversation. It's happened with other pastors who have uh, asked me a couple of questions with regard to specific situations that I'm not going to get into. Uh, and, and if the, the theological discussion makes your head hurt, I'm sure you all understand this in some area of your life. You know, maybe you're a Ravens fan, so that means you don't watch games with Steelers fans. You get that. I mean, maybe um, you have certain political beliefs, so on election night, when the returns come in, you don't hang out with those who have differing beliefs. You know this, right? This is kind of how people act. Um, what you think about things, how, how you uh, respond to things, that impacts your relationships with other people. We, we know this in everyday life. And if our gospel text is nothing else, it is a demonstration that that is also true in the vertical relationship. That how you uh, think of, of what God has said impacts your relationship with him. Your response to what God gives impacts your relationship with him. But before we dive into the gospel text, let's set the stage a little bit. This is Holy Week. This is the last week of our Lord's life before his death and resurrection. Opposition is not just mounting. It is full-throated. He has flipped tables, right? He has told a parable like last week that the Pharisees and the chief priests understand he's talking about them. That parable of the vineyard where he's going to take it away from those wicked tenants and give it to someone else. They are upset. Opposition is full-throated at this point. And so Jesus tells them another parable. This time, the kingdom can be compared to a king who gives a wedding feast for his son. And, you know, everything's ready, so he sends out his servants to call those who had already been invited. But those people don't show up. They ignore it. And what's worse, when, when some servants get sent out, some of those servants are treated shamefully, and they are killed. And those who had been invited to this wedding feast the king was giving ignored the invitation. Now, the, the king gets rather upset at this. He becomes wrathful at this. And he sends his troops to those murderers and to that city that had killed his servants and he decimates it. He torches the place. And then looks at other servants and says, okay, the feast is still ready. So go out into the main roads, good or bad, I don't care who they are, bring people to the feast. And the servants go and do this. And the hall gets filled. And then the king starts walking through. And he sees something out of place. He sees a man who is there who doesn't have a wedding garment and says, hey, friend. FYI, he doesn't really mean friend when he says that. Hey, friend, how did you get in here without the garment? And the guy is speechless. He has no response. And so the king tells his servants, take this guy, bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness where there is weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And then we hear that all too familiar phrase I'm sure many of us have heard before, for many are called, but few are chosen. So, so what do we do with a parable like this? How do we, uh, how do we understand it? 
Well, I think the first half is pretty easy. The first half, um, those who had been invited to the feast, that is, that is ancient Israel, those are the Jews who then reject Jesus, and so they actually kind of get removed from the invitation list, shall we say. They're invited, they're called, but they want nothing to do with it. And so they are cast off in a pretty violent way in the parable, I'll give you that, but they are cast off. I think we get that part of the parable. It's a little easier than the second half, where all the good and the bad get invited to the feast, and they come, and then there's this guy. This guy who isn't wearing a garment, who clearly was invited, otherwise he wouldn't have been there. And because he doesn't have the garment, it's cast out. Now, I've heard preachers, I may in my younger days have even said something like this, uh, but I've got to kind of tend root and say it's probably not the right way to read this. Um, some people suggest that, you know, the king handed out garments to people coming in, and this guy just slipped in the back door and didn't grab a garment. Not really how it worked back then. Maybe it's a possibility, right? I don't want to say somebody's wrong, um, but it, it's a possibility that that could be the case. Far more likely is that this guy got invited to the wedding feast and didn't go home and change. What I mean is, he didn't put his best clothes on. Now, if your best clothes are a tux, you would have worn a tux to the wedding. If your best clothes are something else, you would have worn that. You, you don't wear your, your normal kind of everyday... I mean, I, I, unless I knew someone really well and wasn't going to get in trouble, I wouldn't wear my normal shorts and flip-flops to somebody's wedding. You get that. And that's kind of what's going on here. This guy comes in, kind of just wearing whatever he was wearing, not necessarily the best thing he had. And so the king asks him, how'd you get in here without a garment? And because the guy doesn't have a good response, he gets cast out. And while it may be a little more difficult to suss out what's going on in the second half, if you think about it, it's the same thing that happened in the first half. Somebody invited to the feast didn't take the invitation as seriously as he should have. Those who were invited to the feast took that invitation lightly in the first half. They didn't really care all that much. Ah, so what? The king's having a feast, I don't really care. And this guy in the second half, ah, the king's having a feast. Whatever, I'm going to go, but I'm not going to make a big deal about it. It's kind of the same thing in both halves of the parable, um, that, that those who are invited by God to his wedding feast, some of them don't take it seriously. They take it lightly. Now, what does that mean for you and me? Because the second half of that parable would probably give you cause to take a breath and just think for a minute. Because that guy was actually invited. And that guy actually showed up. The problem is he still didn't take the invitation of the king all that seriously. Those of us today um, were invited by God to this place and we've shown up. But do we always take the invitation of the king seriously? I would say, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't. We, we make light of the king's invitation those uh, Sunday mornings where we'd rather sleep in than show up. We take the invitation of the king lightly when we pretend that any other event that this church does, whether it be a consignment sale or a trunk retreat or a gingerbread bazaar, is somehow more important than what happens here every Sunday morning. We take the invitation of the king lightly when we act as if what the king has said doesn't matter, and that could be in any area of our lives our relationships with other people, the way we treat our kids, the way we treat our spouse, the, the, the way we interact with those who we think are somehow less 
than us or those who disagree with us. There are there, there is an innumerable number of opportunities for us to take the invitation of the king lightly. And this parable should serve as a warning to us not to do that. Because the king's invitation is a gracious one. He has come and set a feast for his people. He has called them by his word. He has assured them that the garments that they need for the wedding, guess what? You've already got them in your closet if you're baptized. He has, he has given them a feast of his son's own body and blood that you might feast on life eternal, that you might taste the promise before you see it. Don't take it lightly. I, I, I love... The, the hymn the choir sang, you may hate the tune or how long it was, but go home and read those lyrics again. Especially that last verse, because I think that last verse captures it. O holy love, thou canst not brook man's cruel and careless enmity. O ruthless love, thou wilt not look on man robed in contempt of thee. Thine echoes die, our deeds deny thy summoning. Our darkling cry, our meddling sound have all but drowned the song that once made every echo ring. Take up again, O oh take, the trumpet none can silence or mistake, and blow once more for us and for all the world. Living and clear, the feast is ready. Come to the feast. The good and the bad, come and be glad. Greatest and least, come to the feast. That last verse it should be our prayer. That God would not ignore our darkling cry and meddling sound that drowns out his gracious call to come to the feast. That actually he would take up that trumpet that he has blown throughout the centuries. That he first blew in the people of Israel. That he blew once more in the coming of his son. The one that he blows every Sunday morning or any day his people gather. The trumpet that calls us home. Home to the feast that God has prepared before us. This morning that trumpet has blown again has blown once more for us and all the world to hear that he has set his feast. His feast of his son in, with, and under that bread and wine. His feast that calls to us and reminds us that we actually belong here. The, 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 the call to the feast where we don't have to worry about what we're wearing because we've already been robed in the greatest piece of clothing we could have in the waters of baptism, robed in the righteousness of Christ himself. This morning he calls to you again. Don't take it lightly. The feast is ready. Come to the feast. Amen.